God be with you. Welcome to our worship today at Faith Lutheran Church in Kelowna, BC. Today is the second Sunday after Pentecost, and so we've begun into the long green season of Pentecost, or what gets called in the Anglican and some other traditions, ordinary time. You will notice that uh, for the first readings, the Old Testament readings in this time in the church, in the season after Pentecost, that it's kind of a, a semi-continuous series of readings. And so we read continuously uh, in chunks throughout the Old Testament. And so we begin today reading in Genesis about Sarah and Abraham, and next week's reading will build on that, and the week after that will build on that, and we get to go through those wonderful Old Testament cycles of, of stories. And so we begin today by singing in Christ Call to Baptize. In Christ Call to Baptize we witness to grace and gather a people from each land and Flowing waters we share in Christ's death, then rising to new life, give thanks with each breath. In Christ's call to banquet, one table we share, a haven of welcome, a circle of care. Although we are many, One cup of thanksgiving proclaims Christ our head. In Christ called to witness, by grace we will preach the life-giving gospel, God's love we will teach. By grace may our living give proof to our praise. In costly compassion, reflecting Christ's ways. Unite us, anoint us, O Spirit of love, for you are within us, around us, above. Equip us for service with gifts you bestow. In Christ is our calling, in Christ may we grow. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, without you we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. God, in the form of three messengers, announces to Sarah and Abraham that they will have a child. Sarah, because of her advanced age, laughs at this seeming possibility. But nothing is impossible for God, and in due course Isaac is born. Now, Sarah confesses, everyone will share in her joyous laughter. Here begins the reading. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, 
If I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the timeline of the COVID-19 pandemic, we currently find ourselves at the tail end of the first wave of infections, at least here in BC we do. Or as Dr. Bonnie Henry and Minister Adrian Dix said in one of their daily COVID-19 updates, we have come to the end of the beginning. In BC, the distancing and mask wearing and hand hygiene efforts have paid off and the rate of infection has gone down dramatically. That's good news and we ought to be proud of how well we have done. But we need to be careful, careful that our celebrations are not premature and lead to a relaxing of all the good and helpful things that we are doing. It would be a crying shame if we got so excited by this good news that we got complacent and stopped doing all those helpful things 
and the infection rate, and more importantly, the mortality rate, began to rise again. Most models for the way this pandemic will play out include some sort of second and maybe even a third wave of infections. Based on how pandemics in the past have gone, some experts even say that those latter waves could be worse than the initial wave. A few weeks ago, BC moved into phase two of our provincial start restart plan. That has meant a very cautious relaxing of some of the restrictions that we've been observing the last few months. Some businesses like hair salons, restaurants and libraries, some public spaces like beaches, parks and playgrounds are allowed to open with proper distancing and sanitation being practiced. That has naturally led people to wonder about other activities like church services. Some are wondering if this slow reopening of the retail and public service sectors means that we can begin to gather again for weekly worship. The short answer to that question is not yet. Remember, this is the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. All indications are that regular in-person worship inside a building is still a way off. That is disappointing news to many, myself included. But all the advice that we have been getting says that we need to see the infection and mortality rates continue to decline for a while longer before we can even begin thinking about coming back together. Know that I and our church council and our bishop and the synod leadership are keeping up with the latest news and are making decisions based on what is best for the long-term health and well-being of our members and our community. All this challenges us to think differently about the church. We all know that the church is not a building, that it's a people, but we have a hard time conceiving of those people being the church without being able to meet together in a building. What will be the long-term effect of this time on the church? What will be the legacy of COVID-19 on the arc of history of the Christian church? The church will survive this pandemic. There is no doubt about that. But what will it look like and how will it function after the dust has settled and we're back to our regular routine? Will we be changed and will it be for the better or for the worse? I tend to be an optimist. And I think that we will learn from this crisis and ultimately be better for it. And if we approach this time in that way, thinking positively and looking for the lessons and the wisdom in it, then we will surely find it. One way to think about the current state of churches is not to think of them as closed. If the church really is the people and not the building, then the church can never truly be closed, at least not simply by locking doors and restricting access to a building. One popular internet meme and Facebook post puts it well. The church is not closed, it says. The church has been deployed. I think that's a very helpful way of thinking about the church during these trying times. Our buildings may be closed, but the church goes on. The people go on. The gospel goes on. Ministry in the name and love of God goes on. The church lives in the lives of its people. We aren't just gathering in one place on Sunday mornings anymore. We're gathering online or over Zoom or in small groups in parks and parking lots or any number of other creative ways. The church has always relied on gathering together in one place to inspire and equip the faithful. In fact, most world religions do. There are churches and temples and mosques and shrines and chapels and any number of structures built for the sole purpose of gathering people for worship. The faithful have always relied on gathering together in one place to exercise their faith and to seek inspiration. 
But in our reading today from St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus models a very different way of doing ministry. In the 10th chapter, we read, Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out, to cure every disease and every sickness. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Before the church was ever assembled, it was sent. Before the church was ever gathered, it was deployed. The word that is translated here as sent is the Greek word apostello, the same word from which we get the word apostle. To be an apostle literally means to be one who is sent. Here is an early image of the church as Jesus takes the twelve from being disciples and students to being apostles, ones sent out into the world to proclaim the good news in word and deed. That was a break from the usual way of doing things in the first century. The religion of that day was a religion that we might be more comfortable with, one which required the faithful to come to the centers of faith. God was in God's house, and the faithful came to make their offerings and to support the central religious faith. What Jesus does in sending out the disciples is quite radical. It undermines the central religious system and takes faith and spirit and the unbinding of burdens out into the field, out to where the people are. As we live through a time now when the church is not able or not allowed to meet together in a centralized way, it is helpful to read passages like this that remind us that there are other ways of being faithful, other ways of being the church that are entirely consistent with our scriptural tradition. The church deployed is not something new. It is in fact very, very old and may even be the very first way that the church ever was. And in listing the names of the disciples, we are reminded of those, of, of the, that these people were, were prior, who these people were prior to any association with Jesus. They were ordinary working class folks, commoners, some with skills in a trade, some with schooling and training in other areas, and as we hear those names read, we realize who they are, and we see how this radical new movement that is to take place in and among the people is to be one that doesn't require great scholarship or participation in the schools of the wise. There is no need to go and study at religious centers. In fact, a fisherman can do this. Jesus sends the twelve apostles out with very little training other than watching him. And he sends them out not to foreign lands at faraway places, not to Gentile or Samaritan territory, but to their own neighbors and their own neighborhoods, to the house of Israel. Our reading today is just the beginning of those instructions, of their instructions. It's short and it's to the point. In essence, Jesus says, go and depend on the kindness of others. Go to people's homes. Go to where they're, where they're at. Go and stay where you are welcomed and move away from where you are not. Try not to be discouraged. Do what you can and trust God for the rest. But most importantly, don't stay Go. Go with the grace of God. Go by the grace of God. Go for the grace of God. Deployed and sent is not something new for the church. Our current situation does not threaten the work of the church. It may challenge us and it may move us from a comfortable place. But it doesn't threaten us or our mission to be apostles of good news in all that we say and do. We have always been an apostolic church, 
a church sent. We might think of this time of pandemic as our path back to that. We don't need to be anxious to rush into meeting in person again if it isn't safe or advisable. For the love of each other and the health and well-being of our community, we continue to stay apart. And in so doing, we claim our apostolic heritage all over again and get back to where we came from, a people proclaiming the love and grace of God one person at a time, one person to another. Really, it's all that we've ever been asked to do. Amen. Go now by the power of the Holy Spirit to be the church in mission, to do the will of God in the world. Amen. We sing, Will You Come and Follow Me? Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare? Should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean? And do such as this unseen, and admit to what I mean in you, and you in me. Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found? shake the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me lord your summons echoes true when you but call my name let me turn and follow you and never be the same in your company i'll go for your love and footsteps show, thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world, saying, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless theologians, teachers, and preachers who help us grow in faith. Guide your church that we might be a holy people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, 
the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. Where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for all that you have provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused. Feed all who hunger. Heal those who are sick, especially those we name aloud or silently in our hearts. Empower all whose voices go unheard and help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of this congregation that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you bring all people to yourself. We give thanks for the holy people who have gone before us. Sustain us in your mission until the day you bear us up to join the saints in light. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, Convert, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn we sing, We All Are One in Mission.
Love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.